Turning then in our studies of John's Gospel to this 15th chapter to come to consider our fifth study on discipleship in this upper room teaching by the Lord Jesus. Thinking this evening in verses 1 to 17 of growing discipleship. And there are many things growing within our society which are oppressive and restrictive to families, to peoples, to businesses. Pollution of beaches and seas is something that is growing. Cases of racism is also something detrimental that is growing. The number of shop thefts perhaps related to hiked interest rates and lack of response uh, from so, some uh, calls for help is causing such a, an enterprise to grow. We are aware that evil does not stand still. Give sin an inch and it will grow. It gets bigger, it gets stronger, it gets badder, it gets darker and more dangerous. There are many things in our society detrimental to goodness, godliness, discipleship that are growing. And we are called in this passage to be growing in our likeness to Jesus, in the graces of Christ, in the fruits of of the Spirit. It's a challenging setting both in the context of these verses as we have seen and is within our society, school, world community to be growing as disciples of Jesus. This is the fifth feature that we're identifying in Jesus' teaching, taking as our theme discipleship. We have thought already of serving discipleship in that acted parable of Jesus as he, in contrast to the disciples who were wishing one of them to do this, bent down and washed their feet. He girded himself with the towel. He took the servant's role and then he taught them that serving discipleship is what we're called to do to serve one another, even in the small, menial tasks of life. He then taught them about loving discipleship in that new commandment that he gave them, to love one another. And we thought about the newness of this commandment was the degree to love their neighbor was something encased in the Levitical code that's found in the Old Testament legislation. But the newness of Jesus' command resides in this, as I have loved you. The degree of that love is his standard of grace and compassion for his people. We thought also of believing discipleship at the start of chapter 14 believe in me, believing in his words about heaven and the many mansions, believing in his worth, claiming to be in the Father and the Father in him, believing in his works that he has done and that he says we will do even greater. Believing in Jesus is part of faithful Christian discipleship. And last time we thought about obeying discipleship at the end of chapter 14. And now we come to this fifth aspect of discipleship, growing discipleship, growing as a Christian. It's a difficult concept to measure. It's a hard thing to grasp in, in any sphere of life. A parent looking at the infant with the infant day and sometimes by night, handling the child, Loving the child, caring for the child, does not see the child growing before his or her eyes. An acorn takes decades to grow into an oak tree. The Douglas fir will just grow 10 feet in 10 years, though it will eventually grow to 80 feet, the largest tree in the United Kingdom. Growth in any sphere is difficult to see, to witness, to gauge, to measure. And so it is as a Christian to consider this evening, am I growing? How am I growing? Where am I growing? What, what is hindering me from growing? What is helping me to grow? A study here of Jesus using this metaphor of the vine and the branches producing fruit 
will perhaps help us, encourage us, inspire us, show us perhaps the avenues to go down, the, the ingredients to include in our life, that we will be characterized not only by serving discipleship, but by growing discipleship as well. So we want to consider uh, this metaphor used by Christ of himself and his church, this union that is set out here. And we want to just focus in this evening on three causes for growth within our lives. Growing by pruning. Growing by abiding. Growing by receiving. And if we can grasp those, bring them into our life, they will help us to be growing disciples. Firstly then, growing by pruning, and this is verses 1 to 3 of our chapter, growing by pruning. Here we have it set out for us by the Lord in, in verse number 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Jesus identifies a vine dresser, a vine, and branches and this essential process of pruning. The pruning took place, and I am conscious I'm in the presence of some expert gardeners, something I am very, very far from. I, I consult, I get someone round to help me. Uh, so, various ways of pruning. Sometimes the tip of the vine was cut off to stop the growth. Unwanted flowers or grape clusters were thinned out at other times. Two occasions of pruning happened throughout the year, one in which there was a severe pruning, and then the second in which there was a thinning out, and both of those types of pruning, I understand, are referred to in the second verse of our chapter. There was tremendous care and interest in the vine, as I've already said, on the coins, embossed on the gate at the holy place. Vines in nearly every garden in the, in the houses of Jerusalem. The vineyard, the vine, was a concept well known to the disciples, to the Savior. But the sole purpose of a vine, and, and this is a point that's emphasized in these verses, the sole purpose of a vine is to bear fruit. It's good for nothing else. Never think of building a house with a vine. Never think of, of, of trying to light your fire in the winter with a vine. It's absolutely use, useless for anything else. Ezekiel chapter 15 dwells on this point. He, he talks there about uh, trying to hang a vessel on a peg made from a vine. Absolutely no point in doing this. There's other wood for that purpose. Use the mahogany, use the oak, use the beech, but don't use the vine. The only purpose of the vine is to bear fruit. And Jesus dwells on this. How does this fruit come then, he's saying? And it comes by pruning. By the two prunings in the year, the severe prunings, the, the pruning it back. And what does that metaphor mean? And Jesus interacts with the meaning, with the message, alongside of the metaphor in verses 1 to 3. And it seems that he identifies two types of pruning, two meanings of pruning within our Christian life that will help us to bear fruit. One is by the word. He says this in verse 3, doesn't he? Already you are clean. And that's the, the very same Greek word that underlies the word clean for the word prune. That's in verse number, number 2. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And here is one way that, that, that pruning represents the, the, the effect of God's word in our life, correcting us, seeking to remove what is wrong, what is weak, what is sinful. God's word 
is like this horticultural action of pruning. And this has been very evident already uh, within this upper room ministry. You remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, then he spoke to them. He corrected them. He taught them. And they felt the smart of his word when he said that what he had done, they should be doing to one another. His word was pruning them of their pride and self-righteousness. Again, at the end of chapter 13, we, we, we studied about Peter's assertion that he was willing to die for Jesus and die with Jesus. And Jesus cuts him off and he says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. That's the word pruning him. His pride, his self-confidence, his misplaced courage in himself instead of in Jesus. The word pruning the disciples. Through the upper room, we have Philip wanting to see the Father. And it was a tremendous aspiration, a wonderful desire. Show us the Father. And again, Jesus corrects him. He prunes him and he says, you've got this wrong, Philip. He who has seen me for the past three years, you've been seeing the Father. So this is one way that the pruning comes to us. God's word, correcting our thinking, correcting our attitudes, our spirits, correcting our actions. You are clean, Jesus says. You are pruned because of the word that I speak to you, that I have spoken to you. But there's another way, and perhaps it's the other way that you're more familiar with and you've thought about and perhaps applied in your life. And the other way of pruning, perhaps it's, it's indicated in the second verse, and it's, it's by trial. Just as the, the, the pruning is severe, just as the pruning uh, uh, it brings the, the vine down to absolute nothing, so trial brought into a life by the gentle, wise, skillful hands of God the Father in verse 1, the vine dresser, knowing what he's doing, an absolute control and authority over our lives, just as the vine dresser is over the vine, with skill, precision, care, experience, wisdom. God the Father brings pain, trial, difficulty, disappointment, hardship into the lives of his disciples. But it's not to damage us. It's not to end us. It's not to finish us. It's not to destroy us. This is the wonder of this metaphor of the vine. Yes, the vine is brought down. The vine is humbled. The vine seems dead. It seems lifeless. It seems gone. But the vine dresser knows what he's doing. And from that vine comes more fruit and beauty and life than there had ever been before. Sickness, loss of possessions, persecution, slander, bereavement, temptations, none of these experiences are pleasant in our life. And yet our Heavenly Father controls every experience that comes to our home, that comes to our life. The denial of Peter brought more fruit into his life. The suffering of Job refined that man. The wrestling of Jacob with the angel all night shifted his confidence from himself onto the Lord. He was never the same after that dark, painful, prolonged encounter. So our heavenly Father, by the word and by trial in his providence, prunes his disciples. Ruth, through her bereavement, through her removal from one land into another with all the heartache and tragedy and difficulty of that, was a refined and changed woman. I came out of a home 
recently in pastoral visitation and said to my fellow elder, that person's refined. The trials, the difficulties, the challenges that the Heavenly Father had brought into this person's life had deepened them, refined them, sweetened their words and outlook. Growing by pruning. The word and trial. If you're not good at looking after plants, what you need is the ZZ plant. Its other common name, the non-Latin name, is the eternity plant because it can survive in little light. It can survive for weeks without be, being watered. The ZZ plant is what you've been looking for if you're useless at managing plants. But if you want color, if you want variety, if you want something with the awe factor, you'll need to prune your bushes, your plants, your shrubs, because it's that pruning that brings the zest of life, the growth. And so we're to let God's word prune us daily and weekly at church, to allow his word to filter into our minds, to have our notebook at the ready to write down something that comforts us, something that challenges us, to allow his word to prune us. Then trials were to seek by God's grace that they will benefit us. Elizabeth Prentice, the daughter of Edward Payson, known as the Seraphic Payson because of his great eloquence, she wrote to a friend who was suffering, and she said, don't let this tragedy of sorrow fail to do everything for you. She wanted the trial to bring blessing and help to her friend. The second way that we grow is by abiding. And this is moving on to verses 4 to 8. And the word abide, and the, the young people can count this up in verses 4 to 10. The word abide occurs 10 times. This is the dominant theme and emphasis in the second section in John chapter 15. The vine and the branches, they're, they're linked together. They're, they're interconnected. And the branches are depending, they're abiding in the vine. Now the Lord, before he comes on to this positive aspect of abiding, he talks about not abiding. And, and this was something that's very raw in the minds and hearts of the disciples at this time. There are branches in, in a vine uh, which are, are not fundamentally or truly connected to the vine and so they don't produce fruit. So verse 6 mentions this. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. The vine dresser not only prunes the good branches, but he removes the fruitless branches. All the branches don't bear fruit that are in the vine. And this is set in the context of the upper room and it helps us to understand the terminology that is used here. We struggle perhaps with this terminology within our reformed tradition. How can a branch be in the vine and yet taken out of the vine and taken away and burned? We're to understand this in the context of the upper room with Judas, one of the twelve within the inner circle, called by Jesus, empowered by Jesus. In a real sense, he was in the church, but he wasn't a true believer. He didn't bear fruit. He exemplifies what our Lord is talking about here. Here is a branch that in a, a some sense is in the vine, in a limited sense is in the vine, but is not truly spiritually connected to the vine. He's a professor. He, he belongs outwardly to the church, but inwardly and truly he is not part of the vine. But Jesus goes on to talk about those 
who are truly in the vine. And what abiding means in verse number 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is what it means to us to abide in the vine. And this is how we will grow, not just by the pruning, by the vine dresser, but here, this union to Jesus Christ, abiding in Jesus Christ. And you're saying, well, well, what does that mean in practice? How do we abide in Jesus Christ? Well, here in this seventh verse, uh, we have this, this two connections set out for us, which helps us to understand what it means to abide in Jesus. It sets out for us this communication that Jesus is communicating to us and that we are communicating to him. This is what it means to abide in Christ. We have a real, living, saving, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as that relationship is functioning with this communication from him to us and from us to him, we will grow as disciples of Jesus just as the vine grows, that is in, that the, branch, the branches grow, that is in the vine, is connected to the vine. So see that the first area of communication, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. This is him speaking to us. This is his word coming down to us. This is Jesus as the exalted prophet communicating with his people. My words abiding in you. This is us hearing his word. This is us responding to his word, submitting to his word. This is Jesus speaking to us through his word. My words abiding in you. And then the other area of the communication is us speaking to him. He says, ask whatever, whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is the other side of abiding. Jesus speaks to us in his word. We speak to him in prayer, and, and what a tremendous promise is, is set out here for us. We talk with him. We seek his wisdom. We desire his strength. We pray to him, and in doing this, we grow. We abide in him. We have our Bible reading plan to, to cover the whole Bible in a reasonable period of time. We have our prayer list, which helps us through the week so that we're covering a wide range of people beyond our family, beyond our nation, beyond our own needs. Abiding in Jesus his word coming into us regularly, powerfully we trust. Our prayer going up to him for great things, for, for big things, for vast things. And as we see those prayers answered, we grow, we develop, we become strong as disciples. I saved the deacons and the new deacons a lot of work by pruning the tree in the front garden. They're welcome to come around and inspect it. There were branches, in my humble estimation, that were not really in the tree. There were no leaves on these branches. There was no fruit on these branches. And so those branches were removed. And the aim is that the, the tree will flourish and progress and the living branches will grow stronger. They're abiding in the tree. We're to abide in Jesus Christ, the living head of the church. This has got to be the prayer for our children, isn't it? That they're not just in the church service, and that's a, br a brilliant thing. And not just in a Christian home, and not just in the Sabbath school, and not just in the CY. But that they are truly, really, personally in Jesus Christ, that they know him savingly and are bearing fruit by the power of the exalted Savior. Prayer is an underrated means of spiritual growth, would you think? We consider service as something which challenges us. We consider Bible reading as something which provides spiritual nourishment for us. But few of us, I would judge, 
suggest, consider prayer as a means of growing as a disciple. And and part of our frustration is that you and I have prayed for situations. We've been praying for Gaza and Ukraine for for weeks, for months. We've been praying for unconverted people for years. And there seems to be no change. And that's where our frustration is. And our doubt enters. Is there much point in this? What is the benefit of prayer to others, to ourselves? But a theological answer which helps us a lot is that prayer does change things. And the fundamental thing which prayer changes is ourselves. As we humble ourselves each day before God, as we plead with him, as we trust him, as we accept the answer, no or or not now, we grow in our relationship with our heavenly Father, and our risen Savior. And here it is in verse number seven for us. Not only the words coming into us, but prayer, whatever you wish you ask, and it will be done for you. So growing by the pruning, circumstances, the, the word, growing by the abiding. And then thirdly, growing by receiving in verses 9 to 16. And and I think uh, Jesus is is pulling us in closer now to the mechanics, if that's the terminology, of of the vine, how this horticultural masterpiece works. He's getting us closer now. He's he's putting the the microscope on it and and he's he's going beyond the, the branches, the trunk, into the inner workings of the vine and the sap which usually begins in the month of March to enter into the branches, begins to flow, bringing all the nutrients and all the power and all the vitality that these branches need to produce fruit, its primary function within the horticultural landscape. And it seems that Jesus is, is teasing out this for us in verses 9 to 16. What does it mean then to be in the vine? What does it mean to be one of my disciples? What what is it that you'll receive from me that will empower you and embolden you and enthuse you to grow and and to bear fruit? What is this spiritual sap that will flow into you from the head of the church into his members? And it seems there are four aspects that are set out here, four things which come from the master to the servants, from the vine into the branches. Firstly, his love in verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Here's something flowing from the Savior to his people. His love, I have loved you. This will enable, this will inspire, this will promote growth. That he loves us. And, and, and it's in the Eros tense. If you, if you need to know this, if you want to know this, I have loved you. And the reference seems to be to the cross. I have loved you. That moment, that big moment that big moment of display, that big moment when we cannot doubt, that big moment when we cannot question. I loved you then. Whatever your circumstance, whatever your trial, whatever your failure, whatever your darkness, I loved you then. You can see that I loved you then. And we're to feed on that. We're to live there. We're to camp there. We're to remember this. I have loved you. And you see how he He takes us away now from the the horticultural image because there's nothing there that can compare to the vastness of his love. And the only measure of his love is not on earth. It's in heaven. Among the Trinity, he says in verse 9 and 10, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. This is the level he's at here. 
This is the degree. This is beyond the vine dresser. He's set aside for the moment now. We're in the Trinity, this inter-Trinitarian relation, and the Father is loving the Son. And Jesus says, I, not that I love him in the same degree back, but I love you with that same level of love. That fruit-bearing which he promotes, which he desires, he facilitates by the assurance of this divine love. Secondly, the second thing that comes into us in this spiritual sap, if that helps you understand it, is in verse number 11. He says that my joy may be in you. Alongside of this love, I have loved you, is, is his joy coming into us, flowing into us from heaven. And it's, it's the joy of obedience to the heavenly Father's purpose. And well, that's his joy. His joy of submitting to the will of God, to the purpose of God, to the experiences that God has for him in his life. And he wants us to share in that joy. And as we obey and follow him, my joy flows into us. A third thing which comes to us and enables us to be growing disciples is in verses 12 to 15, especially in the 15th verse. This idea of not being his servants anymore, but being his friends. It was rooted in the cultural context of the great divide between friends of noble people and the servants. The servants were peripheral. The servants knew few of the secrets of the master. He would share his plans for his business with his friends. His house in Hungary, he would talk to his friends about. His expansion within his enterprise would be shared with his friends. They would receive Share of his knowledge, but not the servants. But Jesus says, you're not my servants, you're my friends. And the language here in verse 15, all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. This is the vine and the branches relation. His love is flowing into us. His joy as we obey the Father is flowing into us. Here his knowledge is flowing into us. All this knowledge and revelation that the Father had given to the mediator, he is passing on to the disciples. The knowledge of the cross, the knowledge of the resurrection, the knowledge of heaven, the knowledge of the church, the knowledge of sanctification and the descent of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be in Christ, to be abiding in Christ. There is this ongoing communication between him and his people, his love, his joy, his knowledge. And lastly, verse 16, his commission. I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. His authority his plan and purpose for the apostles was that they should bear fruit. And in this instance, it's the fruit of conversions as they go into all the world. This is a, a mini great commission just in this 16th verse. I appointed you. His direction, his commission, his authority comes to them and to us and sends us into the world. And this is another dimension of the fruit that he commands and that he facilitates that you will bear fruit in seeing people converted throughout the earth. It's hard sometimes to distinguish a Christian from a non-Christian. Perhaps both go to church. Perhaps both keep the Sabbath day. Perhaps both are good family men. And yet there's this massive divide as this chapter indicates to us that the one is in Christ. And the other isn't. And being in Christ is transformational for this life and the next. And part of the, the aspect of being in Christ emphasized here is that tremendous communication from Jesus into his people. His love, his knowledge, his joy, his commission. Young people are being challenged to find their identity 
in many areas. And academic success by getting really good grades in your exams. Perhaps in wealth, in accruing a, a massive, large bank balance. But our fundamental identity is our union with Jesus Christ. Abiding in him. Being pruned by him. Receiving from him. By these means, we will be growing disciples.